For the hardcore community, a weight class is defined by the sum of violence, talent, and combat. The gutsy display of a prelim fighter is cherished just as much as the main event title fight, because that is what MMA is all about. Then you find out that the pay-per-view featuring a supposedly anticipated title fight did a grand total of 50,000 pay-per-view buys. Hardcore fans tuned in via crack stream, but the casual viewers just did not care. Don't get me wrong, talent is an importable benchmark, but for a division to break into the mainstream, you need something more than a dominant champion and a handful of great fights. To enter the golden age, a division needs a superstar. I'm always looking to make history every single day, and here we are again, more history. Once that guy shows up and captures the title, we enter the good times. We've seen this transformation before. Back in 2015, the 145 pound weight class was suddenly the most important thing in MMA. Uh, it's not actually the 145 uh, five pound division, it's the McGregor division, you know what I mean? Wherever I go, we'll be ahead of whoever's on the card. It's that simple. And just a few days ago at UFC 292, we witnessed it again. Ever since its inception, 145 was adored by hardcore MMA fans, and in that circle, the weight class was considered the pinnacle of mixed martial arts. Jose Aldo was the champion, and he was a freak athlete, maybe pound for pound and skill for skill the greatest of all time, but the chatter outside the diehard MMA community was non-existent. Almost every fight was a brilliant display of athletic ability and superb skill, but the majority didn't care until a loud, flashy, corporately worshipped hype job showed up and the rest was history. Conor McGregor was the guy and his final obstacle was Jose Aldo who at that point was unbeaten for over 10 years. The meteoric rise was just meant to be and Conor was impressive all the way through, knocking every featherweight but one. And at UFC 194, he did the impossible and knocked out Jose Aldo in 13 seconds. The long reigning multiple time defending champion overcommitted, and the challenger capitalized with a pullback counter, ushering in a new era. With the featherweight division out of the shadows, the division below, bantamweight, took its place, often ignored and seldom appreciated. Maybe someday, the 135 pound division would get a Conor McGregor type personality as well. The bantamweight division progressed even more rapidly than 145. You had Dominic Cruz, TJ Dillashaw, and Henan Barraus, the OGs, and the next wave of contenders was even more formidable. One of the things that's exciting about what's going on right now in the bantamweight division is that there's so much talent. Mm -hmm. It might be the most talent stacked division in the UFC. It's hard to say, but from my money, I think 35 might be the motherfucker because there's just so many guys. Aljamain Sterling, Cordy Sanhagen, Pyotr Jan, and Umar Nurmagomedov were all talented and championship worthy, but there was no superstar in sight. Cody Garbrandt had some promise, but he didn't last very long at the top, and so the status quo remained intact for the next few years. Lots of talents, but little to no spectacle. In 2017, on the inaugural season of the Dana White Contender Series, a dude named Sean O'Malley showed up, scored an impressive knockout in the first round, and declared the start of the Sugar Show. Welcome to the Sugar Show! He wasn't as brash or loud as Conor McGregor, but he definitely had star potential. Dana White saw it, Snoop Dogg saw it. O'Malley! O'Malley! And while the fast track to the title was open for him, O'Malley went a different route. He was knocking people out and establishing himself as one of the finest strikers in the division, but his opposition consisted of fighters outside the top 10. The controversial loss to Cheeto Vera was predicted to start his downfall, but O'Malley recovered just fine and kept stacking his resumes with knockouts, building up the sugar brands for the next round of contract negotiations with the UFC. When Sean O'Malley secured himself a top level contract, he entered the title pictures of the most cutthroat division in the UFC. 135 had gone through a transitional phase when TJ Dillashaw was suspended, and out of all the high-level fighters, Aljamain Sterling was the guy who held the championship, and he was the most successful at keeping the title, even surpassing Cruz and TJ. I've always known he was very good. It turns out he's better than I thought that he was. Great, you guys would have to say the same thing though, right? But just how good is he? Sterling was underestimated and underappreciated for the majority of his title reign. But bro, the boy Aljo just can't catch a break. It's like, no matter what he does, people don't like him. Why don't people like Aljamain Sterling, dog? Uh, He's old! His win over Henry Cejudo earned him respect and prestige, and fans finally came to realize Sterling might be awkward and funky, but he was elite 
and his ground game was second to none at 135. It was hard to believe a long rangey striker had any chance against Sterling, and by past experiences, we weren't wrong. Long story short, I wasn't up enough at all, and Aljamain was up here, and I was like here. With most of the contenders already defeated by Sterling, Sean O'Malley was the next in line, despite having exactly one top five win, a controversial decision over Piotr Jan. The McGregor comparisons had cooled off a lot because Sean didn't talk as much as Connor did, and he had a loss on his record, while the Irish superstar was undefeated at 145, but there was still a faint trace of deja vu, like destiny was at work, and it was time. Time for the bantamweight division to enter the golden age, but Aljamain Sterling was simply a nightmare matchup. In terms of in paper, all you should win. You know, very, very comfortable and to say that, you know, Aljamain's strength in wrestling maybe be too much there. It's going to be really good for the bantamweight division. Who wins? I think Sterling. He had out-wrestled and outstruck an Olympic gold medalist not too long ago. So what was a tall, lanky and brittle striker going to do? Sean O'Malley was not well-rounded, not a good enough grappler, and he definitely wasn't proven enough was just a loud, flashy, corporately worshipped hype job. UFC 292 was the stage of the most lucrative and important bantamweight title fight in UFC history. We had seen Cruz vs Faber, TJ vs Cody, Sterling vs Cejudo, but the main event of the pay-per-view, the dominant champion vs the protected superstar was going to determine the next phase of the bantamweight division. While most expected Sterling to grab a hold of O'Malley and ragdoll him, the challenger remained on his feet for the first round and put the fear of the knockout in the head of the champions with constant feints and movement. In the second round, Suga defended the takedown attempt with little issue. And once the two fighters returned to the center of the cage, oh, got out, hit him with that fucking right hand. Damn. It happened all Good over night. again. <laughs> the long reigning, multiple time defending champion overcommitted, and the challenger capitalized with a pullback counter, capturing the title very few expected him to get, and igniting a new era for the division. Destiny. Destiny. That's destiny, man. All it took was one punch, one perfect counter, and Sean O'Malley was the new champion. We've actually seen this a few times. Brock Lesnar at heavyweight, GSP at welterweight, Conor McGregor at 145 and 55, and now Sean O'Malley was the guy who brought the often ignored bantamweight division to the limelight. The Sugar Show has finally begun, and as it turns out, Destiny was indeed at work on the night of UFC 292. Hope you enjoyed, but I gotta bounce. Catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.